wonderful. It's frankly disgusting. All the news you can use. Even the Klan never marched into a church. Smaller classes. The week's top local stories and newsmakers straight ahead. It's your week reviewed next. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us on this journey through the news of our week, pouring through the week's top stories. Mr. Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. From The Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson from 41 Action News, reporter Kat Reed, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. A week after Kansas City, Missouri voters overwhelmingly approved taking down Dr. King's name from street signs in Kansas City, Mayor Quinton Lucas is now asking for your help. He wants to know what you think is the best way for the city to honor the slain civil rights leader. The mayor has asked the Parks Board to spend the 90, next 90 days collecting your ideas. On screen is how you can share your thoughts. Looking at that time frame, though, we'd be wrapping up that public input phase around Valentine's Day in February. What would happen then, Kat Reed? Well, presumably there'd be some sort of decision as what we are going to rename after Dr. King. But I, I think it'll all depend on what we hear out of those public meetings. I do expect that one thing we, we could hear people bring up again is 63rd Street, because that's something I've heard uh, through this entire election. What if the, the public overwhelmingly said we wanted to name the brand new single terminal at KCI Airport after Dr. Martin Luther King? Would that then happen? It should. But uh, we're, we're kind of reinventing the wheel. We've already had public input. We've, we talked to a cross-section of people throughout the city. We got the input. We gave that to the city council. The people spoke, and they said that that was what they wanted. I don't know why we're doing this again. Parks and Recreations are in charge of the parks and the boulevards. Why are they the contact point? And let me just say one thing. I, I watched him the next morning after the defeat on the news, and he took responsibility. But he made a comment that I found offensive as being a part of that committee, saying that we met in secret. There were absolutely no secret meetings that we had. And he was saying, well, it looked like it was secret. It wasn't. We had one closed-door session for 15 minutes where the city's legal department came and told us what the procedure would be in order to do that. So I don't know why we're reinventing the wheel again, but I guess it looks good and he's running things and that's the way that he wants Steve, to do it. I was going to say, I think from a political standpoint, it's important for the mayor to reset things here. I think in the wake of a tough defeat like that, you sort of have to uh, start over again, listen to the public and get the process moving forward here. Um, this is going to be an interesting moment because you just wonder, you know, my sense from hosting a radio show is, can we build a consensus in this community uh, over how to honor Dr. King? The ideas are all over the place. Having said that, you do hear a little more about 63rd Street. But boy, this is going to be an interesting but th exercise. But there's a petition the drive to rename J.C. Nichols Parkway. That's right. So uh, that would create an awkwardness. I, I see Sly James even speaking out about that this week, saying we, if we want to honor King, he was about being conciliatory. Do we want to do something even more divisive by trying to do that? I don't know if we'll see J.C. Nichols renamed, but one thing I wanted to bring up was actually about the terminal. There was a little bit of disagreement at the time over do we want to rename the airport or are we renaming the new terminal? And I remember Mayor Sly James was very adamant it's the terminal, not the airport. And even aviation officials had said it would be a huge nightmare, very confusing, if we renamed the airport. Yeah. Can, can I just say quickly, the, the key thing to me is the assignment of this to the Parks Department, because I think that's a hint that one of the recommendations that will move forward is to enhance the existing Martin Luther King Park, mm -hmm. fix it up, provide new uh, amenities, places for kids to play and that that would be the least politically difficult thing to do because it's already named for Dr. King. Uh, I think that any street you pick or the airport is going to be controversial. I get the sense 
that the mayor and others around him don't want this to be controversial going forward, so I'd keep my eye on what the parks people Now, do. just because the election is over doesn't mean that's the end of this issue, and that became even clearer this week when Kansas City Congressman Manuel Cleaver took to national TV to compare the tactics of Save the Paseo supporters to the KKK. Uh, in the black experience, uh, that doesn't happen. E even the Klan never marched into a church uh, but you don't do this in a church. I've never done it in a church, and you can't pay me to do it in a church. Uh, the, the thing was confusing uh, because on the ballot, n a no vote meant yes, and a yes vote meant no. All right, save the Paseo organizers say they're incensed by the congressman's portrayal and insist their group was made up of citizens of all races and more African Americans, they said, voted to take down Dr. King's name than to keep it there. First of all, is that accurate, Eric? Where the African American, more of them yes. voted. There were quite a few that voted to take it down as well that lived in that corridor. But, uh, you know, people know that the KKK blew up churches. You had Dylan Roof with white supremacists go into church and kill uh, quite a few people. So I don't know exactly what his his point was with that statement. But then in some readings it said that they didn't go into churches when SCLC was having a rally. So I don't know what his point was there, and I haven't talked to him. He's been tied up in, with the impeachment hearings as to what he was really trying to say. What about the confusion issue? D were voters confused about what was yes and what was no? I think that there's probably a little bit of confusion because even as we were trying to break down the question here on the air, there was a moment of, wait, this means this. So I think there is a little bit of confusion. But if you look at the numbers within the urban core of the city, it was majority voting to take the name down. I will point out quickly that Save the Paseo was a, a multiracial group of people, including uh, former Councilwoman Alicia Kennedy, who continually brought up the fact that this wasn't about race, it was about the process. You know, Nick, if this had been a close vote, we We'd be having a different conversation here. But nearly 70 percent of voters here uh, agreed with the idea of removing Dr. King's name here and restoring the Paseo. That begins to remove, at least in my mind, any sense of racism or something else really out of line. Eric. In black culture, there are some things that we hold sacred, our mothers <laughs> and the church and some ministers. So I think his point was, in our community to us, the church is a sacred edifice and we shouldn't be having rallies there, we shouldn't be having demonstrations in those facilities. Were those remarks, they happened last Sunday on Al Sharpton's show on MSNBC, are they forgotten today as we've moved on to so many issues well, uh, or is that still going to linger? No, I think it lingers a little bit. We wrote about it. I think we're talking about it here today. Uh, I do think, uh, Nick, that the Save the Paseo people probably should not have gone into the church just as a political matter. It doesn't look good, but to compare it to the Klan is also pretty aggressive. Uh, or to say it was worse than the Klan. And I do think that will linger a little bit. What's always interesting, of course, is that Congressman Cleaver, as he did as mayor, sort of denies he really made that statement and he's trying to uh, muddy the waters a little bit. So I do think it will be an issue for him. And it just shows, Nick, the very difficult nature of this entire question, the rhetorical yes. excesses of all sides. It's so hard to stumble into things you don't really want to say. That's why I think there's a real move to cool off and then see if there's something that everyone mm -hmm. can accept. This week, the first public hearings in the impeachment inquiry of President Trump got underway on Capitol Hill. The I word is creating political clashes here at home. In the Kansas 3rd District, two of the main challenges to Congresswoman Sharice Davids are fighting over the issue. Republican Sarah Hart Weir has attacked her primary opponent, Amanda Adkins, for being insufficiently supportive of the president and for failing to mention the impeachment hearings in her campaign statements. Adkins calls the attacks silly games. But at a time when Sharice Davids has been accused of hiding on controversial issues, are some of her opponents doing the same thing? Is Adkins trying to hide for cover and have it both ways, Steve? You know, I'm just really struck here, Sarah Weir going after an opponent for not being more uh, supportive of President Trump at a moment like this is a pretty dangerous game. Sarah Hart wants to win the primary. That's her first challenge. You do that by going to the right and endorsing and being supportive of President and Trump. That's step number one. But you have to win the general election to go to Congress. Sharice Davids beat a Trump-backed uh, opponent in 2018, Kevin Yoder, by nine points. The district has shifted away from President Trump 
dangerous game she's playing here. But Sarah Hot Weir is also going to have another uh, someone in that race, uh, uh, Adrian Foster, the former mayor of Roland Park, who was, it was somebody who was one of the first people to endorse locally uh, President Trump. So she's going to be eating into that vote, right? Oh, perhaps. I think that both of them are, are Trump supporters who will be speaking about that quite a bit. It seems like Atkins was trying to, you know, she's definitely has said in statements that she supports Trump and calls this all political theater silliness. But I think that she was trying to play it more down the middle to prepare for the general. Mm -hmm. Is this playing out in any other races in our metro, Dave? Well, the support or lack of support for President Trump is an issue in virtually every Republican primary. Who is for him and who is more for him? And that's why so many Republican office holders, including, by the way, Kevin Yoder, who was an incumbent, have such a difficulty in navigating that because in the party he's popular, in the more general public, as Steve points out so correctly, he is not as popular, particularly in our area. So uh, I, I think every candidate in every race has to make a decision. Am I in the Trump camp publicly or am I not? And in the primary, that's a much different calculation than it is in a general election. Now, is Crosby Kemper, the head of the Kansas City Library, got his fingers crossed that President Trump will stay in office? The Metro's best-known library director has just been nominated by President Trump to lead the main federal agency <laughs> responsible for funding our nation's museums and libraries. The Kansas City Library is now reportedly <laughs> working on a secession plan. Kemper has to be confirmed by the United States Senate. I'm assuming Kemper wouldn't be considering this if he thought the president was departing the office soon. Well, I think that's right. Uh, this is uh, a feather in the cap of Crosby Kemper, uh, an important uh, federal appointment, national appointment here. I was at a, an event earlier this week where this was pointed out. Crosby Kemper was in the audience and applauded for this. Uh, so good for him. Should bus rides be free for everyone? Kansas City taking a step closer this week to being the first major city in America with a free transit system. Mayor Quinton Lucas says he wants to see this happen, and soon it would cost about $8 million a year to eliminate fares, we're told. How does the city pay for that, Eric? With ridership. Uh, the bus company gets paid by the number of riders that they have. And I think it's a great idea, personally. A lot of incidents that you had, I interviewed the new director and president of the of KCATA, and he said most of the incidents that you have at the bus happen at the fare box. So you would eliminate a lot of those. He said basically the fare box money that they make off of it goes back into repairing fare boxes. So that's another thing that they would save money in being able to do is not have people putting trash in the fare boxes. Can't. Yeah, and I'll just point out that only 10% of the KCATA's operating budget comes from the fare boxes. So I think that that might be surprising to people. They might think that more mm. money is coming from that when it's really not. We, we talked with the mayor about this, and I wrote an editorial about this issue earlier in the week. The mayor has been working on finding the $8 million. I talked to Troy Schulte about this. They think they can identify the money. The problem a little bit is long term. You can find it for one year, but eight million or nine million every year is a little more difficult. But they think they can get there. The bigger hang up, Nick, is the Johnson County and Wyandotte County users of ATA. Johnson County leaders, Wyandotte County leaders are far less enthusiastic about free bus service. And they are worried about the idea that you'd pay a buck and a half to get from, say, Oak Park Mall to State Line and then suddenly it's free. And, and so you know, there is some concern about working through that difficulty before they go to a free full service, but the mayor told us he thought it would, there was a 60% chance it'll happen next year, and this is part of that movement. You know, I think this is really an interesting political uh, moment here for the mayor. You know, his agenda is really set on long-term projects like affordable housing, improving development on the east side of the community. None of those things are going to be win wins for him immediately, Nick. It's going to take a long time to realize gains. If he can get this, this gives him a big win in the early part of his administration. All politicians would welcome a move and a development like that. So that's one reason why he's certainly pushing forward here. Next up, from buses to planes, regardless of anything else you may have heard, the new revamp of KCI Airport is ahead of schedule and on budget. At least that's the word this week from the developer of the new single terminal project. Edgemore says it'll now be complete in the first two weeks of March 2023. That means you'll be able to shop, eat, and fly ahead of the 2023 NFL draft, which will be held in April of that year at Union Station. Can we mark this down in permanent marker pen in our day planners, Kent? Well, I think we have to, because any later than that is going to be pushing up very close to the draft. Although it is interesting, because we initially had that 
November 2022 date set and then we were told early 2023 and it sounded like oh we just got to get through the holidays first and then we'll do maybe a January 2023 opening so I do think that this is even a little bit later in the first quarter than it initially seemed it would be but they're going to have to make it happen because the draft a big part of securing that bid was the fact that we would have a new terminal up and running. Are there still stumbling blocks though along the way last week in uh, what is the big story we missed segment my Michael Mahoney from Channel 9 said concerns over the hiring of minorities and women workers on the project was the biggest thing we missed. It's smoldering, he said, and will continue to smolder. How big an issue is that, Eric? Right now, it's early in the project. Uh, the numbers should get better, but a lot of the things that they were doing originally to begin with, you don't have a lot of minority vendors that do demolition of parking lots and that kind of thing. But I think as it goes along, it'll get better. Uh, and the input, the workforce, they're, they have a big push for the workforce numbers. And that's where the, the most of the money will come back into the community through those workforces. So 9% of the project budget has been spent so far. So I think we will see the numbers go up. And interestingly, uh, there is some discrepancy in the numbers and um, the way that Edgemore has been calculating things versus how the city's calculating. So Edgemore says that if you look at their numbers, they're short on professional services, but at construction services, they're 22 for minority businesses and 20% for women businesses. So there's just a lot of that uncertainty. So I think it's going to take some time to figure out where we really stand. Are there any other obstacles that would prevent the airport, the new single terminal opening in March 2023, Dave? Well, just the weather can be a problem. Uh, hiring enough workers. Eric said something very, very important, which is Kansas City will need to focus on the workforce itself. How many minority actual people are at the site swinging hammers, running screwdrivers uh, on the project as opposed to how many minority contractors are involved, which is a different issue. Um, New Orleans just opened its new terminal, Nick, one year behind schedule. So things can happen and may happen on this project. So far, though, it seems to be moving roughly in the right direction. And with all the other projects that you have going on with the hotels, there's a limited pool. So to get to these numbers, there's going to take a lot of work. A, a limited trained pool, too, yeah. by the way. That's an important yeah. issue as well. Now, there seems to be a lot of angst and anger across the metro this week that had nothing to do with events on Capitol Hill all over the Paseo Street sign election. In Shawnee Mission, hordes of teachers converged at a school board meeting to protest poor working conditions, unsustainable workloads, classrooms of too many kids, and yes, a lack of cash, even though they are the highest paid teachers in our metro. In downtown Kansas City, tenants angry over a decision to postpone debate on a new tenants bill of rights at City Hall. Let's start with our teachers. If Shawnee Mission teachers feel so put upon, why aren't they walking out or waging strikes like we've seen elsewhere around the country, most recently in Chicago, but also in red states like West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, and Kentucky, Steve? Because the public perception of that, Nick, would be so negative. As you just pointed out, they are the highest paid teachers in the metro for that group of folks to actually walk out on strike, leave the students behind, leave the administrators high and dry would be a really tough thing for them to do from a political standpoint, would not play very well. And this has really become a debate about workload. Although salary is mentioned, it's a lot about the workload right. that they're doing six classes a day versus uh, colleagues in neighboring districts doing five classes a day. And they had hoped with um, the settlement of the funding debacle in Kansas that they would finally go back to teaching five classes and that's something that it is going to maybe take more time to figure out. We, we had the opportunity this week at the editorial board to sit down with Governor Laura Kelly and talk to her about this issue, other issues as well. But I asked her, it was the all the extra money that the state is pouring into the schools, was that meant for salaries or was it meant for workload and classroom size issues? which we think are probably more important in our area, that the money wasn't for the teachers, it was for the kids, the students. And she said both, primarily because salaries are so poor in other parts of the state. You go to some districts in rural Kansas, teachers are making $30,000, $35,000 a year, and they needed raises. Here it's a different issue. Here it's a way to try and narrow class sizes, reduce the workload, and give the teachers a little bit of a bump. I still think they're on the track to try and do that. And on the affordable housing issue, what was interesting about that story, seeing the, the people upset, the Casey tenants upset at City Hall, is the fact that Quinta Lucas, the mayor, has hitched his wagon to the affordable housing issue. Why then delay until December when most people are concentrating on holidays and gift giving? Uh, why the delay? 
They have some bugs in that uh, Bill of Rights that they need to work out. There were some things in there to kind of make you raise your eyebrow. So I think he's given them some time to work those things out. The owners of property also are kind of pushing back against some of the things that are in that uh, Bill of Rights as well. Yeah, the landlords and the investor community really um, showed up to the previous, the first hearing of the bill alongside the tenants. It got very contentious, very heated. And so I think that they decided to kind of take a deep breath, let's go back. And the tenants are still saying, or rather the landlords are still saying that they feel like they have not had a seat at the table in this discussion. This is a huge shift, Nick, in the power dynamic in this community between landlords and tenants, and that's exactly what's playing out at City Hall here. Uh, part of the issue is the tenants want a lot of money spent on tenants' behalf for legal representation, yeah. for example. City Hall needs to find that money. There's a lot of moving parts here. That's why they delay And by it. the way, we are lifting up the hood on this affordable housing issue. KCPT takes its cameras to the Plaza branch of the Kansas City Public Library next Wednesday night at 6 as we bring together housing advocates, tenants, landlords, home providers, Mayor Lucas and you. Go to kcpt.org and click on the events tab to reserve your spot. I will see you there. You know, we talk a lot about problems and conflicts on this program. Shouldn't we also point out the successes? This week marks the 20th anniversary of the reopening of Union Station. That after voters on both sides of state line agreed to hike their sales tax to pay for the renovation of the crumbling historic building. It had been shuttered in the 1980s and home only to pigeons before that vote. Is this Kansas City's biggest modern day success story or do we need to point somewhere else for that, Dave? Well, it, it's, a, it's a huge metro-wide success story, and I think if you talk to the folks who were involved at the time, as I did repeatedly <laughs> as a reporter, there is, there is today some disappointment that that model was not e expandable to other projects in and around the Kansas City area. The Bi-State 2 failed, and the I ATA, we just talked about that, and the differences between the two uh, sides of the state line on uh, transit remains a concern. So, but But on its own terms, I think we can all say Union Station was a success. That building exists. It's an office building now, but it was a success. Steve. You know, people forget, Nick, that a decade after the station reopened in 2009, there were serious conversations in this community about shuttering Union Station because the finances had simply gone haywire. The $40 million endowment fund had been churned through uh, just to pay for heating and cooling in that building. Very expensive proposition. Folks like George Wastello, who's been honored recently by the native sons and daughters of Kansas City as a Kansas City of the year. You know, this guy stepped in, uh, figured out that leasing office space was the way to go. Today, it's a huge success story. Yeah, he's done a tremendous job. And I have to say, just as someone who was kind of an outsider who came into this community two years ago, I had no idea how recently Union Station had been renovated. To me, it seemed like something that was just so a part of the fabric of Kansas City. So that was kind of amazing to me to learn more is, about. Is there any vision then for a project like Union Station? where Kansas and Missouri voters could come together once again to support something, or are those days well gone, Eric? A new downtown baseball yes, stadium. There you yeah. go. There okay. you go. I really didn't want to go into that again. All righty. But that's we'll, where we, we might be going right there, though. That's, you think so? All righty. Kansas City has settled on a new brand image. Is it jazz? Is it barbecue? Is it fountains? No! It's the KC Heart logo, popularized by the Kansas City apparel company Charlie Hustle, though the design made its first appearance on the sleeves of Kansas City's Negro League baseball players, the Monarchs. Charlie Hustle giving away the design free to the Kansas City Area Development Corporation, which is in charge of marketing our bi-state region to the nation and to the world. Is this now familiar image, a fitting tribute that encapsulate what Cap Casey is all about, or does it say we're out of fresh ideas on how to market ourselves, Cap? One of the things I first noticed coming to Kansas City, at, and it's been a quote from other people, is that you notice folks walking around wearing these shirts when you come to Kansas City. So I think it's cool that it harkens back to the monarchs, and I also think, you know, we're in the heart of America, so it plays off of that. It's a pretty recognizable symbol. Eric. It's a good symbol. It's something different, and we probably have run out of ideas because it seems like every two or three years they come up with something different. Yeah, I would, would just add that I've been through about six different symbols, <laughs> I think, during yeah. my time in Kansas City, and we all yeah. get excited, and then it goes away. Hey, look, 10 seconds. 
The mechanism, by the way, for Union Station still exists and might be used for downtown baseball. Okay, I think the Z-Man sandwich, my, my sons might have picked that for the logo. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, when you put together a program like this every week, you can't get to every uh, headline making our local news. What was the big story we missed? Was it more layoffs at our metro's largest private employer? 130 jobs cut at Cerner, that's on top of the 255 workers eliminated in September. Sonny Perdue in town, the nation's agriculture secretary, visiting the USDA's new research headquarters site downtown. Is Kansas City about to become America's largest milk producer? Kansas City-based Dairy Farmers of America in talks to buy the largest dairy company in the country. Dean Foods just declared bankruptcy this week. Overnight, we'd also become the land of lakes. They own the butter brand, too. Disgraced former Jackson County government leader Mike Sanders back in the metro. He's just been moved from federal prison in South Dakota to a halfway house in KCK. Sanders was convicted of wire fraud last year. The city of Lawrence debates outlawing single-use plastic bags. Meanwhile, a local coffee shop taking matters into its own hands Oddly correct in Midtown, eliminating all disposable cups. They now want you to buy a dollar glass travel jar if you want your caffeine to go. And the Kansas City Star says so long to Saturday newspapers. The Star's parent company says they'll be digital only on Saturdays starting next year. What did you pick, Kat Reed? I'm going to combine two of the environmental stories that came up there, the coffee cups as well as the plastic bags. Uh, when I lived in D.C., it made a huge difference, just that nickel fine for using a, a plastic bag. So it does change behavior, and more and more people would be carrying reusable. Eric. I would say Cerner. Cerner got a considerable amount of taxpayer money for their project. And now it seems like that they have these projects built, they're laying people off, and that wasn't a part of the agreement. Steve. I'd say the return of Mike Sanders to the Metro, Nick. I didn't know he was back till I, I just read <laughs> yeah. that. And it's a reminder to every elected official in the Metro, what can happen if you go astray? The city council approved the downtown strata project uh, significantly reduced. There could be a veto. There may be a lawsuit. And that is our week in review. Thanks for joining us.